Is everyone in? I think we're all good, yeah? We got a couple of crap on the you say you did this. Let's see. Jamie, can you pass me uh, that cup, please? Oh, thanks. It's my breakfast, so. <laughs> the last two or three coming in at the back. I hope we've got enough chairs. If we don't... Yeah, we're going to need more chairs. Uh, down, see down. So we'll get you a couple of stools in. I'm sorry guys, last didn't get the cheap seats. I'm really sorry. I'm just going to get you a couple more chairs real quick. I'm sorry you've got a... Uh, Brian, there's a bigger chair coming for you. It's slightly better. I apologise, uh, we don't have enough chairs for everybody, I'm afraid. All right, let's begin, I suppose. If you see the battery going off, do let me know. The last time we did it, the battery died halfway through. Have we got enough chairs? Okay. All right, let's just begin, I suppose. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate your time. We are live on Facebook, but I'm not showing people's faces. So if people are having an objection to that, please tell me and you happily move seats. It's just trying to be a resource for people. Uh, I know quite a lot of people here. Uh, I don't know quite a lot of people here. So hi, I'm Jay. Uh, can I just do a quick test of who we've got from where? Who's, who's a K1? Who's a K1 teacher here? Okay, so I know where we're looking. K2? K3, uh, primary one, two, three, four, five. Are we up from there? We up to all primary levels here as well, primary six. Cool. So to say the obvious, primary five and six aren't necessarily going to be learning phonics. However, you're a teacher and it's a good skill to have and you can draw a lot of other skills out of this knowledge. But also I've, I work with another school in other areas and we've recently identified slight illiteracy issues with phonic awareness that nobody ever took the time with primary four, five, six to sit them down and check. Do you actually understand phonics? Are you phonically aware? So we've gone ahead and started up a, an intervention program there because it's not a skill that you'd really need to leave to Matium. Uh, it, it's way too late by then. So I'm generally talking to the choir, I'm talking to the kindergarten teachers, but as a primary teacher, you should be able to draw a lot of info out of it. Um, so people that don't really know who I am, I just, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we, we're kind of online here. We've got EAC school page, which is where today's seminar is being posted live. It will be posted as a video later. So if you don't get to take notes or whatever, you can just come back and rewatch it. Um, there's my private uh, my uh, YouTube channel. We've got about 14 or 15,000 subscribers. There's a lot of, there's a couple of hundred videos there. And my private Facebook, well, my professional Facebook, uh, where everything gets posted there as well. So part of the agenda today is A, to help B, to showcase my own school, of course. I'm not trying to be shy about what we've got. And C, I want some support. So if you look on the front of the notes I've left, uh, I would appreciate if people could help. Go to Facebook, check in, like, subscribe, go to YouTube. Just try and support me, basically. Um, and that would be really useful. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, Education is not the learning of facts. It's the training of the mind to think. Anybody that's ever stepped into a old-fashioned classroom will, will appreciate what I'm trying to get at there. We're not trying to teach children, C-A-T, cat. That, that's not education, that's memorization. Um, well, one thing I've found, and you might have found if you ever worked in a non-program compared to a program, that, that the ability to learn is higher with kids that learn phonics, with kids that learn with a modern education structure, that their ability to self-teach, self-learn is higher. And that has a lot of positive echoes. All right. This is another, they're all cliches of course, but they're a cliche for a reason. Give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day. Teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Um, the idea being that if you teach someone the actual skills needed to decode language and to encode language and to produce and receive language, um, you don't need to then go and teach them their 600 core words or their 800 core words. They'll go and do it on their own because you're a great teacher and you've motivated them. Right? As opposed to C-A-T cat blow a mail. You get that lot in Thailand. Uh, and, and it's just rote memorization. 
and it's not really setting up the internal system and thinking, they're not then able to go ahead and use that skill to do something else. All right, so this is where phonics plays a really important role. Um, phonics, by the way, just to be brief, uh, this is normally like a whole day seminar, so we're going to squish it down to an hour. And let me also just briefly uh, say this at the very beginning, I suppose. <coughs> what this is not is it's not a jolly phonics seminar. I'm not here to teach you how to be jolly phonics teachers because I'm not qualified for that. I'm not a jolly phonics representative. There is a company in Bangkok that will do that for you. I'm here to explain the difference between phonics and what is phonics because some people have come from different backgrounds. Maybe no one ever took the time to explain that to you. So just to be clear about that, I'm not doing this as a, you are now trained in jolly phonics. Go ahead and do that. Uh, this is just to give you a taster of what's out there and then feel free to contact me later and I'll put you in contact with a professional trainer. Um, phonics teaches confidence. It's essential that a child has their own success on their own terms. Uh, the ability to go ahead and independently learn after you've been given knowledge. Um, your child will be able to read new words without waiting to be taught. So, you know, I've, I've, I've walked into a class before, I've heard a teacher saying, C-A-T cat, C-A-T cat, and you're going, excellent, wonderful, that's great. What about B-A-T? So I don't know. We're waiting for the teacher to teach us that word. If you're learning one word at a time, you've got a long journey ahead of you. It's just going to take forever. You can't, you can't learn your head words in, the, in, the, in like a year if you do waiting in one word at a time. And then contextualizing them and comprehending them, it's not, not going to work. Reading is not natural. This is a really important concept for people. The humanity in its modern form, sapiens, we've been around for like, at the most conservative estimate, 100,000 years and probably closer to 300,000, right? And we've always been communicating. We've always been able to communicate in one form or another. You could put a child into any family anywhere on the planet and within a year and a half they're speaking that language fluently. But reading only came around about 7,000 years ago with the Sumerians and cuneiform text and this kind of stuff and you know, then the, the Egyptians took it after that but, but it took us 200 plus thousand years to develop reading. It's not a natural act. You can't just leave a kid in a library and a year later they're reading. You need to lead the way to them. You need to be the professional. You need to know your knowledge, your background. You need to know the system and the procedure involved. <coughs> it's not just random, let's teach words. You, you have to follow a system. And luckily, lots of people much, much more gifted than I have done this before. And they've produced it for us. It's there. You just follow the system. And it works. So um, that's probably the most important part. Reading is not a natural act. If you presume your kids are reading, you're, you're, you're assuming. And to assume makes an ass of you and me if you split that up. Assume, right? So don't do that. Check. Find out if they can read or not. Um, Jolly Phonics, which is what I'm going to kind of focus on today, but like I said, this is not a Jolly Phonics seminar. It's using Jolly Phonics to help you learn phonics. Um, Jolly Phonics is used in the UK, and they do have an American version of it. I've not seen it, but I've heard they do. So the vowels are slightly different sounds, and things are pronounced differently. Um, this is probably the most important bit. It's synthetic. If, if you take away anything about from today's seminar, you want to take away the difference between synthetic and analytical. I don't know who's got a background in phonics here and who hasn't. If I say something that you don't agree with, just say to me, Jay, I don't think you understand that. Let me explain it to you. I'm open for correction, okay? But basically, analytical phonics is what you might have had experience with already. Analytical phonics is that Montessori style where you learn word families. And it tends to have, well, I'll show you a little bit in a minute, but it tends to have the schwa sound at the end, which is that uh, uh, uh. So what you might hear is A, A, B, B, C, K, D, D, F, G, H. That uh, uh, uh sound is called the schwa sound. Um, I once did a video, just a free video on YouTube about this, and I did a quick alphabet and there's trolls out there and some, some guy was just trolling me saying like you failed so badly you had one job to give us the alphabet sounds and you kept saying uh 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 in everything and I even said at the beginning this has the schwa sound in it and he was just really venomous about it so I was like I'll, I'll be very clear about that now that I, today we're not going to be doing that but this is synthetic basically you synthesize the sounds you're observing and then you blend them into a consummate sound into a comprehensive word let me give you an example real quick this is the analytical phonics. This is, these are a couple of screenshots from training I used to do for the government on this phonics. We used to have to teach 
these kind of books, which you've probably seen, like, you know, Oxford Phonics World and other things like this, are all, they're, all, they're all analytical. And they generally work in five levels. It's alphabet, the alphabet, which is phonic awareness. This is really important. Phonic awareness is just understanding that phon what phonics is. That's what we're doing today. We're just going to do phonic awareness. Then after that, once you start blending, it's actual phonics. Once you're actually blending sounds together, you're doing phonics at that point. And generally, we begin with short vowels, then we do long vowels, consonant clusters, and uh, special words. That, that's generally how that works. These can often be swapped around. Uh, that's, how, that's how I usually, I usually follow that. And this might be sort of how, how it looks, the word families, yeah? You've got the am, ap, ag, et. Anybody that's doing phonics like this, this is, you're doing analytical phonics. You're basically looking at the Montessori style. Um, and then you, you basically, these are called uh, uh, CV words, right? Uh, VC words, vowel consonant. Yeah, to make sure we've all got the same terminology. Then you add the C at the beginning. Yeah, so you teach them that. There's a load of videos on YouTube from me doing this. I do stage one, stage two, stage three. Um, I, I, I'm less focused on it now because I, I see that it's not the most productive way. But it, it has been a quick fix for primary students. If you find a bunch of primary kids that are illiterate, I've, I've often used this just to, to, to kickstart their phonic awareness, but I'm having second guesses about that, second doubts about that. I think, I, I think I'm going to stop doing that. Um, and then you go ahead and teach them a whole bunch of like, b, ag, bag. And what, what you'll often find with this kind of stuff is, because of the schwa sound, you might get b, ag, bag, man, matter. And you get a lot of this kind of uh, inappropriate sounds coming out. I used to say back in the day when I first started teaching this stuff, when I first came to Thailand, for people that are watching online, we're in Thailand, right? Um, I didn't care that they were doing hamma, jamma, ramma, because at least they were reading and at least they were phonically decoding words. Now I've got higher expectations of our students. I think they're far more capable than they were 12, 15 years ago, thanks to people in this room, thanks to us, right? Because we've helped bring up their ability over the last 15 years. So I'm, I'm, less, I'm less inclined to use this kind of style anymore. Let's just get the very, very basics down. This is really, really important as well. You've got to understand what you're doing, what, 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 it is we, what, what it is we are trying to teach a child. So what is a letter? What is a written letter? These letters, what are they? They're basically pictures. That's all it is, yeah? If you just imagine that, all we've done is drawn a picture. So for example, I'm going to draw a picture here and that's just a picture. That's all that is. There's no implicit meaning in that. If anyone does any linguistics, you look at your Saussure and your Foucault and all that stuff, the, the sign and the signifier, there's no intrinsic connection between the object and the sound you're making. All right? Then we give that, that picture a sound. And the sound of this is G. Now, yeah, you can hear the schwa sound there as well because some letters have a natural schwa sound, B, D, G. But not, all, not the rest. It's like, not H. Yeah? But that one does have a bit of schwa in it, there's a g. And that's the, 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 we've given a name to that, and the name is G. That's all we've done there. Now in Thai, if, you, if this was a Thai seminar, which I, I do the same content in Thai, I'd then relate it to the Thai alphabet, because they've got the same thing. Anyone that learns to read Thai, right? That's a picture. Looks like a chicken, actually. That's why they call it Gogai, the chicken letter, because you can probably do that if you want. I don't know. But it's the same letter. It's a G. They've called it Gorgai as a name. So Thai's phonic too. Of these three aspects to the, the written letter, the one that's the least important is, any ideas? The name. Good, thanks. Yeah, good. Uh, the reason being, when do you use the name of a letter? Can you, can you possibly imagine at what time would you ever need to know the name of any letter ever? When, when you sing the ABC song. When you sing the ABC song, yeah? Or, or when you're explaining it to someone else. Well, we could just say G. Yeah. It's so when we're spelling it to someone else. Or when you're teaching it. Again, that's what we're going to talk about today. Only, only if you've got that in your mindset that you need to use the name while you're teaching. But we don't. Now, the only time we need to know the names is when you're spelling it for somebody else to hear when you're transmitting that word to another person. Well, that's not important in kindergarten. Don't worry about that. Um, by the time you're in primary, definitely, yes, of course. When you're in K3, at the very latest semester two, you're starting to teach them. By the way, that sound we learned is now called A. Um, we don't need to talk too much about that. But, it, but basically, 
What I like to think about is that the human brain is like a RAM, it's like a, it's like a hard drive, it's only got a certain amount of working memory, and what you're asking kids to do with the other Montessori, the more analytical stuff, you need to have learned the entire alphabet before you can even begin blending. You need to have gone A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so you've asked them to get 26 letters in their head, now you need to teach them 26 sounds, and then eventually we're going to start going K, at, cat. That feels like a massive waste of energy, time, and memory space. There's no reason why you have to do that. And it's not a law. All right? It's in these books. That's the problem. I mean, there's all kinds of books, right? There's the Oxford Phonics World Stuff. Uh, these are the really old fashioned ones that you might see from Palangi, the Malaysian company. Yeah, really, a, a, a rat in a van, a ham on a mat, a, a cat on a van. Really, really unengaging, dehobable sentences. They, they, they don't mean anything. When was the last time a man sat in a van with a pan? <laughs> And what's he doing there, the weirdo? I mean, that's just a strange thing to be doing. Why do cats wear hats? I don't know. Uh, they don't. So anyway, that's, that's, you know, relating it to reality, right? It's kind of detached. Quick pop quiz. How many sounds in the English language? Any guesses? Yeah, go on. Oh, well done, Steve. Yeah. Over 44. It depends who you ask. It depends who you ask. It really depends who you ask and um, which theory you're reading and probably whether you're American, Australian, South African or English. I'm sure there's extra sounds in different languages. But basically over 44. There, there's most of them. Um, and this is actually in the order we teach as well. This is the Jolly Phonics product. Again, I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to sell Jolly Phonics. This is a free seminar. I'm not asking for any money. So if any Jolly Phonics execs are watching online, it's like contact them in Bangkok and they'll arrange it for you. Their, their tuition fees are around 50,000 baht a day. Um, for, a, for over two days so they generally want about a hundred grand and they'll drive down here and teach you guys uh, I did hire them for my other school they came up and did two days with my other school and taught a bunch of people uh, it's very very worth it uh, very good money investment if any decision makers are in the room <laughs> I'll give you the info later um, but there's more than this though there's a lot more than this because you got to think how rubbish English is how just stupid it is, how wrong it is, how just, we're just wrong in every time. Like, what's the difference between later and water? Why does A change its function in both of those words? I don't know, English is wrong, it's probably the answer. I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, kids, I've got no answer for that. I mean, it's unless you want... it looks nice when you write it. That's probably, that's exactly, yeah. I'm sure there's some historical reason, but, but more than that, we've then got alternative spellings, which we used to call sight words or tricky words, but, but you don't, like this magic E thing, we don't do that anymore. You just teach it while you're teaching the A. You've taught A already, which is the AI sound. And then you do a unit on alternatives for A. And you teach both. Like, my name is Jay, but I used to live in India, and they spell it that way in India. Like, J-A-I. So it just depends wherever you, where, you know. Um, the, the, I mean, some of the stuff's really, yeah, just insane, isn't it? And this one I don't get. You. I can only think of a couple of words like Cube and Tuesday that use, or Q and Tuesday that use the U it's strange, you know. That one's a big one as well. That's really complicated. All right. So just just to be uh, clear about that, that in Eng English is not A B C D E F G H. That's not. That's really really unimportant. You, you know that, that song really should be taken out of most schools by now. It, it's, it's like a couple of hundred years old. There's some better ones out there. There there are much better ones out there. We, we can let the Thai teachers teach them the A B C song. Whatever whatever whatever, whatever works. Yeah. Well, there's no, there's no use to the ABC song other than memorising the alphabet. And that's not what we're here to do today. We're not memorising anything. We're making genuine connections. Um, now, let me just very briefly explain that Jolly Phonics, this system that I, I, I prefer, has seven groups of letters. Each group has six sounds. Notice I said sounds, not letters. And they're taught in this order. The first group is not S-A-T-I-P-N. The first group is S -A -T -I -P -N. Yeah? Pure sounds. S, at, it, n. And that's how you teach phonics. You don't say S, S, A, A. Don't even cloud them, ram up with that. And what you're going to get if you're in K3 and P1, P2, they're going to start saying, oh, A, O, S. And you're going to say, mm. But just say S. You, you know, you don't want to be negative to them. Do the exact opposite. They just make the sound. Well, that's awesome then. That's really good. Then focus on that and ride those fences because that's. Uh, that's awesome if they're doing that for you. They're phonically aware kids. Um, the reason, by the way, that we use these six letters first 
is basically the first six letters of the English alphabet. You can write uh, not many words really. We're talking three letter words here, CVC words. There, there, there's, there's about you know, eight or nine you're gonna get. You can probably find a few more if you add extra letters, if you start doing you know, four or five letter blends, but it's not easy. It's, there's not a lot to work with. Whereas with these six letters, immediately you've got about 30 words that they're immediately gonna be able to start approaching. And you'll also notice we're not focusing on CVC here. There's a lot of CVC in it, but we're immediately approaching consonant clusters. We're immediately uh, approaching terminal consonant clusters. Yeah, we're immediately approaching the letters straight away. There's no delay time between learning and encoding. Unlike the other style where you need to learn the whole alphabet and you, you're gonna take, be months away from starting any genuine reading. When you get to group two, by the time you've done the first 10 or, 10 or 11 letters, you've got about 60 to 90 words that you can start working with and then even more after that. We've got them all here around the base. I mean, we keep all of every single word that we expect the child to learn. This is all group two. So if you, were doing an, if you were doing like a remedial class where you've got older kids, you could probably get to this within the first 10 days if you're dealing with older kids where you just need to remedy a lack of knowledge. If there's a lacuna between their content in their book and their knowledge, you need to bridge that gap. And I, I do that a lot with, with uh, Jolly Phonics. It's good for high speed teaching if you've got older kids. With younger kids, don't do that. Do it in the correct speed. I'm going to talk to you about the procedures of phonics today, and I will be asking you if you remember this, by the way. I hope. So, I'll do it very briefly. The procedure for teaching jolly phonics. Or, let's, let's not, I don't want to use the word jolly phonics. The, the procedure for teaching this type of phonics. Because you don't have to go out and buy a load of books. You can just start doing it. All right? Is you tell the kids a story. You engage them. And I'm going to show you it. And what we're going to do today, just to give people the information in advance, and I was shocked, I am going to teach you the first six sounds of Jolly Phonics, and we are going to do it like children would do it. Because we've got a lot of teachers in the room, you're not allowed to be shy, right? If, you, if you've got any shame left in you, you're in the wrong job. <laughs> if you've not been dancing on a stage doing nonsense already in your life, you're in the, you know, you, you, why have you not done that yet? Why have you not been on stage or in a stupid hat doing silly things, right? So we're going to do it today. And I'm not shy, so please don't be shy with me, all right? We're going to tell you a story, an engaging little story that involves that sound I want you to learn. After that, I'm going to overtly highlight the sound I've just taught you. After that, I'm going to teach you an action that accompanies the sound. Then we're going to sing a song, because kids love singing. And songs are much more memorable than me just going wah, 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 for an hour, right? You all know the song names to songs you even, don't, even songs you don't even like, right? Some horrid pop song comes on and you're there singing along to it even though you can't stand it because it's got that glue, it's sticky, isn't it? It's sticky knowledge. Then we have to approach the letter formation. That's really important too. I'm still seeing lots of students, and I'm sure they're your students and other people's students, that still write their letters incorrectly. It looks right on paper, but it's been formed incorrectly. And I, I, I can promise you, some of your kids come here, I don't know who's, who Tiki's who, but I promise you, some of your kids will be doing it wrong still, because I'm seeing it everywhere. And an example would be this. If you see a Thai child writing the letter B like that, that's a Thai letter, that's Sara A, that's a Thai alphabet. And the reason you can't let them do that is how are they going to have cursive writing later? Where do you go from here to the A? But when you're trying to write the word bad, you need to be able to have cursive writing. All right, and we'll talk a little bit about that today as well. Uh, and then we have to check, can the child recognize the sound in a word? Have they just nodded? Are they, are they just yes men and going, yes boss, yes boss? But then when it comes down to it, are they actually able to hear that word? Now let me tell you something about the action real quick. I want to just give you a, a small anecdote about when I, when I took the training for this, I, did, I was lucky enough to do it twice. I once paid myself, and then one of my bosses paid for me to go. So I was lucky enough to do it twice. Um, the, the, the trainer's a very capable person, and if he's watching, hi, because I'm going to send him this video anyway. And he, he's very, very knowledgeable about this stuff. And he's got a lot of background in, in, in neurology and neuroscience and stuff. But what he made us do was, it was a room of about this many people, but we didn't know each other. And he made us stand in a big circle, and I said, I'm not going to make you do it, don't worry. And it was our warm-up. And he said, right, we all need to learn each other's names immediately. And I was like, the way we're going to do it is you're going to introduce yourself, and you're going to give me an action that represents your name. 
and why it represents your name. Now, his name was Lok. And he said to me, people call me Loki because I'm in Thailand and they like to give me a nickname. She said, hi, I'm, I'm Lok Key. Yeah, like a lock and a key. So you can call me Lock Key. And he said, oh, cool. And I was next to him. I said, oh, well, I'm Jay. And I know what I said. Well, it sounds like hey, I suppose. So I was like, I'm Jay, like hey. And then the guy next to me was called Chris. And he goes, I'm Chris, like Chris Cross. And we did that. And it went around. It was kind of cool. And then at the end of it, he said, right, now, Jay, you're in the line next to me. Can you, can you give me everyone's name, please? And I was like, oh, shit. OK. Um, so I tried. And I, and I just found it worked. I was like, yeah, well, you're lucky. I'm Jay Hay. He's Chris Cross. She's Eileen. And we, we, got, we went around the room. And, and basically, everybody got everybody's name immediately. Because it's, that, it, it, it's right in the fences of how the brain works, right? How you connect things. You chunk information together. You bundle stuff up. Uh, chunking is another teaching technique, by the way, that if anybody ever wants to do ongoing training here, I've got loads of lectures like this, loads of one-hour hits of stuff about this kind of stuff. So chunking is how your brain works. You, you don't know how to drive from here to Bangkok. You know how to drive from here to the head of the city, the top of the city. Then you know how to get from the city to Chumpon. Then you remember the roundabout from Chumpon up to... You, you don't remember every turn and every... You don't know your own phone number. You know three numbers. Yeah, like my phone number zero eight seven one two three eight seven two one. Everybody chunks their information up like this, and we can tap into that to get kids learning faster and more. What the kids are going to be taught from this procedure is they're going to learn the letter sound, they're going to learn the letter formation, they're going to learn to blend that sound immediately with another sound, immediately apart from the very first letter, because there's nothing to blend it to. They're going to learn to identify sounds in words. And after group three, not for the first three groups, we're going to learn tricky words. Tricky words used to be called sight words. They're part of that 3% of the English language that doesn't fall into phonic awareness. There's not a lot of it, but there is some, and they need to be taught in order, and they need to be taught um, you know, systematically. And, and, and one of the tricks to that is uh, identifying why the word is tricky. What's tricky about the word? So, for example, if I showed you that letter, that word, and you've, you're a good phonic learner and you're going to go, ha, eh, ha, and you're going to say, no, it says he. And the kid's going to go, huh? And you're going to explain what, what's wrong with that. And the kid should be able to say to you, but that's eh. E is this one. That's E R E E E. This one's eh, eh, eh. Why does it say he? Why does it not say he? Why does it say he instead? And once the kid's told you what's wrong with the word, you can say, because this word has a bad attitude. This is a tricky word. This word wants to trick you, and we're better than this. And you have a little chant, you point at the words, and you go, tricky words, you can't trick me. And then you do a review every morning of the tricky words we're learning this week. You're not asking them to memorize it. You're asking them to memorize, or you're asking them to remember why it's tricky. That the word's got a problem, not you. The word's got a bad attitude. This is some, that's what say, that should say shet, met, wet, and it doesn't. They're, they're, they're tricky. And there's no real reason behind it unless you want to start teaching about history and language and all that stuff. Where did my little clicker go? Yeah. Before that, though, before we do the procedure, the first skill that you should, and this is something you can do at all levels, right up to P6, Matium, it's a great little warm up activity. You count sounds. Sound counting, not letter counting. So with the, with the basic CVC words, it just happens that the amount of sounds matches the amount of letters. So if I say cat, the kids, your students, ourselves should be able to go k, a, t. Yeah, there's three sounds in that. So now let's look for the k sound. Let's look for the at sound. Let's look for the t sound. And you, you, can, you can encode a word from receiving the language, k, a, t. But not all words are that easy. So let's try it together real quick. I'm going to ask you how many sounds in the word teacher? T E R. Because it's not er, er, and that's one sound, right? Er. And Thais have that, uh, uh, it's actually a Thai sound. You can put a mito over, you put a tone mark above that and actually get it. And it's in the Thai dictionary. And it says a, uh, a, 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 a sound of positive happy, like a positive agreement, like uh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've probably heard that somewhere then. Yes, each, uh. 
All right. I know the American accent's different. Uh, I'm not American. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't give you any opinion on that. But it is different. You see, teacher, the R is more pronounced. But that's not an issue. That's just the way it is. So this is a skill the kids need to practice daily. One piece of advice I was given again by the trainer at Jolly, the Jolly Learning Company, was um, when he's giving out the books in the morning, he does it with their names. So I'm looking for M I K O M I K. Oh, and you're counting out while you're and Michael, oh, there you go. I'm looking for n a w in na win and, and you're getting them in the habit of counting their own name out into sounds. They're very obsessed with their own name, kids, because it's their, they're important, right? They're egocentric. They're, so using their name. I'm looking for somebody whose name is j-ake, j-ake. Is there a j-ake in the room? And, and, then, and then if the kid himself doesn't get it, all their friends are going, it's you. <laughs> it's, oh, okay, it's me. All right, so that's, that's something to, I, I, I'm very solid on this. We do this every single period. And don't forget, you don't have to wait for a phonics class to teach phonics. When you're teaching any of your activities or your arts or your crafts or whatever it is you're doing, don't forget to integrate all of that all the time. If you're doing the older kids, when you're doing a TH word, ask them, is that soft or hard? Is that th or th? Is it voiced or unvoiced? With the older kids, you don't have to baby them. Teach them voiced and unvoiced words. Yeah? A voiced word, by the way, if you don't know, is something that uses your voice. Uh, and an unvoiced word doesn't. Or the other word is expirator. So, for example, the difference between F and V is only one is voiced and one is unvoiced. And a lot of Thai students or Asian students have a massive issue with that. They can't say violin, they say violin, uh, the W sound. A way of checking is you get them to put their fingers on their tongue, on, their, on their, the voice box, and you go, it's nothing. And then you go, and it's the exact same physiognomy, uh, whatever it is, the same physical muscles you're using. I'm not very good at that word. It's just the same muscles, basically. Don't forget also, don't forget the basics. Don't, don't, don't allow stuff to slide just because you're busy. They've got to remember their letter formation. Are you in the grass, the ground, or the sky? Where is the letter you're writing? Is it in the correct part? of the page, ground, grass, and sky, right? Oh, I keep losing my pen. So normally what we have here on this is we have some clouds drawn here in blue, we have some grass drawn here in green, and some soil drawn in brown. And when the kid's writing the letter, ah, 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 it's always in the grass. When they're doing pa, 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 it goes down into the ground and across. When you're going t, 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 you start up high in the sky and come down. I mean, I'm, I'm meeting Matthew kids that can't do this. Secondary, by the way, home is not from Thailand. Secondary kids who can't do this, who, who are still trying to write everything on the same line, and it's just coming down from bad fundamentals, bad basics. All right? And another one that I'm a big stickler about, are your kids holding their pencil the right way? That's going to have an effect. Are they left-handed? Are you aware who's a lefty in your room? Don't force them. You've got to, you have to figure out, you have to know this about your kids. Um, do you have left-handed scissors available to them? All right, especially lefties, that's hard for them. Um, I know one of the, the ladies who works here, her boyfriend was forced to, to do it right, I think, as a child. And I think it kind of ruined him a little bit, being forced to use the wrong hand to write with. So, you can ask a question. Yeah. But have your kids, um, they fall, but they're just one hand. Oh, wow. Um, you know, they're still learning to, to write, but even when they're kind of really. Wow. Naturally, they're just doing both hands? What's your feeling about that? Is it good or bad for them? How do you feel? Well, I know you don't really work. Well, you've been taught you don't develop the right or left hand if it's until about five. Okay. Um, That's interesting. I'm more concentrating on the piece of work rather than the hand. Yeah, don't worry. But yeah, in that case, if they're not struggling and they're not having an issue, then I wouldn't have an issue either. I'm not an expert on that, but I mean, yeah, my opinion generally is if it doesn't seem to be an issue and there doesn't seem to be a negative consequence, then yeah, let them go with what's natural for them rather than force them. Little tricks. There's a few little tricks. You can buy little tripod grip holders, yeah? You can get a load of those on eBay. Uh, we used to give them away free here. You can just buy a sack of them at the beginning of the semester. Don't get the ones where they're putting their fingers into stuff. That's not good. But the little cute little trapezium, little, what do they call it, little triangular cuboid things that slip over the pencil and you can hold it properly. If you don't have access to that, you can grab the parent and give the parent this trick. You ask them to fold a piece of tissue up like this, and the, the game is the child has to use these two fingers to stop the paper from falling while riding. And it's a game. 
Yeah, it's a game. You're not you're not trying to correct them. It's a game. And the other one is it's the frog legs. They're frog and a log, and the pencil's the log, and you got to get them. You got to make it a game if you're talking kindy. All right, otherwise they they're not going to engage. All right. Right. So let's get into it real quick. Um, what's the first thing I need to do? Story. Story. Let's do that then. Right. So you're now my students, right? Okay, so kids, I'm going to do this in English. Now, I did, I did a Thai seminar in this, and I, I do the same stories in Thai. So if you have any Thai friends or any Thai people in the room, don't feel that they can't do this just because they're not fluent in English. If that person knows that that says, then they can teach this. Yeah, this is a major barrier. I'm not, we don't, I don't like people that look for excuses not to. I like people that look for reasons why they should. And the reason why you should is it's dead easy. So if you've got any Thai friends and they're worried, or parents, encourage the parents to do it at home. They can do it. I promise you, they can. All right. So this is a story, kids. Last Saturday, Susie and Sarah and Steve, we went to the park for a picnic. It was so much fun. It was so good. And we were in the grass. We were in this long grass. And and Sarah said, Sarah said, Jay, Jay, I can hear her. And and then suddenly this this. What, what, what was it? What was it? And then the kids are going to go, no, no. And you go, snake. Yes, it was a snake. The snake was in the grass. So we all thought that was really funny. So we started saying, s, 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 s. And, and Susie showed me her s, 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 snake. Can you do that for me? Everybody show me your snake. Let's do this, please. Get your snake up. And we're going to go, s, 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 s. and then we all started singing a song together. The snake is in the grass. The snake is, and give me a space. Excellent. Now, what you're going to get from kindergarten is this. That's okay. Don't worry about it. That's fine, there, kids. That's just what they do. You get spit going everywhere. That's all right, man. That's okay. Um, the the song isn't the point. One of my major feedback points to this program is that the songs are too complicated. Some of the songs, not that one, but some of the ones later are quite involved. Inky the Mouse is a long one, and, and uh, there's, a few, there's a few difficult ones, but what you need to get is that. That's all you care about. And then the, 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 the tamnong, what's that in English? Tamnong, melody, the melody, right? That's good enough. And then slowly encourage them to learn it with lots of repetition. What, have I, what do I need to do now? I've told you a story. I've given you a sound. I've given you an action. Letter formation, excrement, right. So, the way we do it is this way. I'm gonna use you, because you're right in front of me. You got, got a pen in your hand, I was gonna choose you. I need you to very briefly show me the hand you write with. This hand, cool. So bring your hand up. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically do the letter together, okay? And we're going to go over, under, under. Okay, everybody, raise your writing hand, which is not your right hand, but your writing hand, whatever that would be, okay? And everybody repeat after me, over, under, under. And I'm singing it. I'm not going, over, under, under, like we're getting out of the back of the room here. You know, you're teaching kids. Say, like, over, under, under, that's so good, yeah, well done. And the reason is, I'll talk to you about the technique of that in a minute, but you want the child to verbalize what they're doing. I did a parental seminar on this, and the parents said to me after that, I get it now. My kid's sitting there writing A, going around, up and down, around, up and down, around, up. And the parent thought the kid was losing their mind, and what are you doing? And then I explained what we're doing. It, 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 what I like to think of everything we do is your brain is like a computer and the more places you can store information, the more connections you can make, the faster your brain's going to retrieve that knowledge when it's needed. The more ways you can just store that info, not just there, you want it everywhere, right? And you want to use music, you want to use body. Humans learn three main ways and as a teacher of any subject at any level, I highly recommend you put this into your lesson plan. Audio, visual, kinesthetic. Audio, you need to hear the word, the sound, the image, whatever it is, you're, the, the, the thing you're learning, you need to hear it. Visual, you need to see it. Well, you're looking at it, right? So you're seeing it. 
And I just said it to you, and you're hearing it. Kinesthetic body with your body, right? So if you can physically move, if anybody wants to learn about TPR by Professor James Asher from I think San Jose University, he did total physical response. And the one that they use, the Japanese one that the Let's Go book uses is called uh, MAT, Model Action Talk. But I, call it, I use a TPR. And basically, instead of saying to the kids, run, R-U-N, run, you get the kids to say, run, 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 and they run while they do it. And then they stop. And you sit down, and they sit down. And they just, it's a command procedure. But they physically act what you're asking them to do. And with, with older students, how this, and I do very complicated TPRs. For example, okay, guys, open your bag, and there's nothing there. And they open my opening their bags, take out your pen, write a letter. At the top of the letter, write your name. On the left side, write the address. And they're, they're miming all this. Lick the letter, seal it, put a stamp on it, post it. And it's related to the content for the day. <coughs> so, we've done letter formation, sound, story, song. What's next? Cool. So, I've got these four words here. And we're going we're gonna to count them out. This one, if, if, you, if you can hear that... S -s 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 Give me a thumbs up. You don't necessarily want them shouting it out because kids just shout after each other. And also you're creating a little bit of chaos in the room. And if you're not a really good classroom manager, that could go badly for you. It just added to your style already. But this one here, if we can count, this is a s -un, s -un. Do we hear us in that? Yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, thanks, man. Thumbs up. Great. Yeah, this one is a s -un ale. S -un ale. Are we hearing it? Yeah, we're hearing it. Now are we? This one is a s l ow er, s l ow er. No, we're not. I don't think we're hearing it, are we? Yeah, that's right. Well done. And the last one is a s p i d er. We're hearing it. Excellent. And you, obviously, you'd spend longer with the kids. You would maybe differentiate the classroom at this point. You might have stations set up. You've done the Jolly Phonics intro, or the Phonics daily, daily sound introduction. You've played some games. You've done that. You then have stations. So you're going to go over here and do a writing practice. You're going to go over here and make a picture using that sound. And you six are going to come here with me. And I'm going to check that you're all really understanding this sound or not. And you do two or three minutes with that group. And then you send them off to do something else. And you stop writing. Come over here with me now. And, and you differentiate your classroom that way. Making sure you're getting a chance to hit every group of the room, every class. If not every class, regularly. Good. The next one we're going to do. I told you we're going to do all six. So this is what we're going to do now. And you guys are going to understand these six letters. And at the very least, you've got phase one of this project in your head. And you could consider doing more later. But this one, again, we'll do the story, sound, action, song, letter recognition, sound recognition. So last week, and Annie and Anthony went for a picnic. Lots of picnics, by the way. Uh, uh, Anthony and Annie went for a picnic. And I, and I said, oh, look, Anthony likes to eat a a apples. And it was so much fun. And a a Annie said, Annie said, a a Anthony, Anthony, there's an ant on my arm. And we thought that was lovely. So we started saying a a a ants on my arm. And then we started singing it. And it was so much fun. You can do this with me. A a ants on my arm. A a ants on my arm. A Ah, ants on my arm, they're causing me a laugh. Ah, ah, ah. And then you walk around tickling the kids and they go, ah, ah, ah. Yeah, and you used to have a little ah day. You do ah. This is the favourite song of all of them. Yeah, because yeah, it's just, and, ah, 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 and they start screaming it and they start, ah, and they get so into this one. Um, one thing I will say is that with the, the people that started working here with me, I'm not going to start saying names because people know who we're talking about, but uh, Dave, like, the, the first girl that started, woman started working with me, she said she was amazed at how quick they took this, how fast the kids got traction with this. I, I, I did this training with, with my team, and they were like, OK, we'll try. And then she was like, wow, it's working. Oh, these kids are actually learning to decode really quickly. Really quickly. All right? So now... Done a story, sound, song, action. What's next? Now I'm going, to, I'm going to be a bit more overt this time. With the letter formation technique, I'm going to be a little bit more overt. We've got the letter a, 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 or the sound. A, a, a. Now the first thing I need to do is we need to make sure that when you do this, you're doing it big. Like, we did this a minute ago, and I, I wasn't overt. I just did one example. But what, what we need to do now is a bit more explicit. You need to be large when you do this. You need to be very visual. 
for the kids. Don't do this. All right. So very briefly, can everyone please one more time raise their writing hand? And we're going to say around, up, and down. One, two, three. Around, up, and down. Around, up, and down. Now, did anybody notice something I was doing differently to you? And I'm doing it left-handed. I need to be able to, you, or you, need to be able to write the entire 44 sounds backwards <laughs> with your left hand in the air. <laughs> And it's really easy. <laughs> it does take a while. It does take a while. However, there is a trick. So let me show you real quick. One more time. Now, don't, don't, don't worry about repeating with me, but just watch what I'm doing. And then try and flip your vision around. So I'm going around, up, and down. Around, up, and down. Left-handed. No, wrong to you, because I'm looking this way now. But when I'm looking that way, it comes out correct. Yeah. And the reason being, because say we've got a student that just can't get it. Again, please help me, raise your hand. And we're gonna, then they can do this, you see. I can take that student's hand and I can do it with them around, up, and down. And I don't have to do this whole, well, let me come around behind you. Let me get your pen. <laughs> let me, and then you're just like, oh, your body language is all wrong now. You've got your back to the room. That's another thing, by the way. If you're a teacher that spends a lot of time like this, Think about it. What, what, would you ever turn your back on 25 kindergarten kids or primary one kids? Or anyone, really. I mean, uh, don't turn your back on anybody, really. But, uh, so this helps you stay. This allows you to keep facing your audience, your, your, your students, your clients, however you want to view it. And also body language, right? Hips straight, shoulder width apart, internal authority, not this internal apology thing. Like, okay, listen up, kids. Yeah, listen up, kids. Yeah, we're here, right? Getting eye This is a classroom management thing, but... I just wanted to mention that. When you're giving really important information, stand still. Yeah, and you do it like that when you get full contact. You'll notice today, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to use classroom management here with everybody. I'm getting eye contact. I want to I genuinely connect with everybody in the room while we're teaching this. And that's how I feel about teaching kids. You've got to make genuine connections. You've got to genuinely enjoy what you're doing. Um, there is a trick. Can anybody do that, by the way? Can you do it right now with your left hand? Can anyone do the A backwards? You got it? Let me see. You got it? I do it because my right hand, so I guess I'll do it. Yeah. There is a trick. So I'll show you the trick real quick. So you hold the flashcard up to the kids with this hand and you go, oh, I can see right here. <laughs> That's a trick, by the way. Um, I mean, eventually you want to do away with that trick. You want to be able to just do it. And also, once you've got that skill, can you write entire words? connected with cursive writing and track correctly. <laughs> All right. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I can't. That's the answer. But like cat. But when you do this, you also have to track. Don't forget this stuff. Little things like when I'm counting these sounds, please observe I'm doing it so it's left to right for you. Even the little things we do, even when you're teaching grammar, what is your name? Mm -mm -mm -mm. You want to get these connections to the kids. But don't do it that way. Uh, that way because it's backwards to them or depends how your hand works I just like to do it that way but obviously I'm doing it backwards for me but forwards for them and when you track letters across you must make sure that the kids are tracking some advice that was given to me at the Jolly Learning thing was um, you can get kids practicing tracking with their eyes you know follow the card and they get them doing that and then you try and get them to do it without moving their heads and it gets their mind in the tracking. Another thing that was recommended, which I don't do because they're too expensive, is the big ball crayons. And you get the kids doing anti-clockwise circles on paper to get them in the habit of doing things anti-clockwise. Because in English, that's how we write. Whereas ties tend to go the other way and up. We always go down and anti-clockwise. Little things about your own language that need considering that are confusing these kids. Writing is not natural. All right. Oh, okay. Um, James, yeah. At this stage, you only do lowercase Yep. I rarely, if ever, even worry about capitals. I just don't even bother with them. Um, mainly here, because we're a tutoring school. That's probably the reason why we're a tutoring school. So when I do Jolly Grammar, which is another product, we do capitals. It's in Unit 1. <laughs> so we do make sure that in Unit 1, the kids definitely understand that there are two forms of each letter. Never, never, ever, ever. I don't even... 
I'm sure there's people with a reason why. I'm sure that capitals are easier to write because you always do downward strokes. That's why capitals are usually taught first. But I just don't. We don't need that. That's very old fashioned. Um, yeah, I just. Now. That's right. That's, that's, that's really, yeah. For me, yeah, I, I don't baby the kids in that sense. I make the instructions suitable for their age and consonant with their age, but I don't baby them. When we're teaching grammar, we don't say it's a doing word, they're verbs. <coughs> All right, pronouns. That's what you call each other. Straight up use the technical terms. And yeah, so the answer is, I, I basically never even worry about capitals. Um, if I was teaching a K3 class and I noticed that... Uh, <laughs> Have you gone live with me? <laughs> um, now, we've had a K3 class. <laughs> you good there? <laughs> now, so, um, if I had a K3 class as a tutoring school and I noticed that a kid was struggling with capitals, I'd probably give his, grab his mum or dad uh, and have a quick chat and give him some extra homework. As a, as a homeroom teacher, I would probably set aside a little bit of time for that kid. But you'd probably put it in your primary three, semester two, first, first week syllabus. Get it out of the way real quick. Um, air riding, that's what we're doing just now, okay? So um, also when we're doing, oh, we've got to do the sound recognition. So again, we've got, a, we've got an a, r, o, a, r, o, yeah. We've got an a, p, o, a, p, o, yay. A, n, t, a, n, t, and a spider, a spider, no, okay. Now, we're immediately going to blend. All right, we're going to immediately start blending. And all you need to do, to, all you need to do, what you need to do, it, it's not simple for them. Blending is the most challenging part, obviously. It, it's reading, right? Now, let me just give you a couple of, um, just in case you don't have the, the terminology in your head. Um, re re receptive and productive language. Receptive is reading and listening. Productive is writing and speaking. Yeah. Um, this is the hardest part for them, the productive writing. The pro this is receptive, but when you, when you want to, what your ultimate goal is you could say a word and they could write the word. Or you could write a word and they tell you the word. But keep in mind they're different skills. One is receptive, one is productive. So what you do is you basically point to the sound and you say, repeat after me. S, a, s, a, s. And you do it as fast as you can, you do it faster. And let's do it the other way. A, s, a, s, a, s. You said ass. You got the kids to say ass. It's great. Um, we'll talk about point and say in a minute. But uh, basically, you want them to point and repeat at the same time while they're doing it to be audio, visually, and kinesthetic. All right? But the point is, here, we've only learned two letters or two sounds. In England, you'd do a sound a day because it's your native language. All right? But we're doing non-native speakers. So I'd probably do three sounds a week something like that, and immediately get them blending those sounds. As opposed to the other style, where they've got to be able to learn W before they can spell wag. Wag, bag, tag, rag, all right, okay? Um, this is much more efficient. They're immediately gonna start doing that and putting words together. Um, the next one is the t sound, and the story is that Tony and Terry and Tiger the cat and Teddy were to play tennis, and I couldn't play tennis, so I was helping and I was watching the ball go t t t t t t t. Yeah, and that's how you do the t sound. T t t. You relate it to tennis. Um, you do the song, which is a bit complicated for them, but doesn't matter. When I watch a tennis game. When I watch a tennis game, my head goes back and forth. And all they're going to do is... That's all right. I have a question. Yeah. If they have no background knowledge of tennis. Show them a picture. Show them a... Uh, I think it'd be pretty unusual that they wouldn't have seen tennis. Um, or badminton. But I mean... Like between cultures. Of like if you wanted to use baseball or something. Like... Like kids don't, like Thai kids don't understand baseball. Yeah, baseball is actually the butt sound. <laughs> um, if you felt that that was something that would be a barrier, I would just preempt it and show them it the day before. Or just maybe show them a, the game of it or something. Yeah, and let them play tennis the day before, or let them do something, or show them a cartoon of tennis, or just pre pre prime the carburetor with that. You know, just get them. Get, if you know and you foresee an issue, then that's all our job really, isn't it? Is foreseeing potential ways things could fail and trying to cinch it. 
and that's what we call the lesson plan. And that's, that's why. Regarding lesson planning, I heard a great statement about lesson planning the other day. One of my friends from an, another city said that at his school they have a two-step lesson plan. I said, oh great, what's that? Two steps before you enter the classroom, have a think about what you're going to do. <laughs> I was like, excellent. So we had a little seminar about that, about lesson planning is really important because you're not going to be able to be effective if you're not lesson planning. And I've, done, I've been here 18 years doing this and I haven't got any with me. Have I? I still plan every single lesson like, in complete detail. All right, and all my staff do as well. And we're a tutoring school. The government don't ask for our lesson plans. Oops, I've just ruined her lesson plan. Um, the government don't ask for our lesson plans, but we all are very well aware here that without it, we can't be effective. So we do it. I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, if, you're, if you're, you know, you should, even if you're here for a part time, not here for a long time, you should be here full time in your mind. You're here. It's a career, right? You need to fully invest in what we're doing. The t sound is in the sky. So when we do the t t t, t oh. when we do the t sound, you have to be very overt, and you have to say to the kids, "Okay, guys, get your writing hand up, and we're gonna go up, 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 high in the sky, up, up, high in the sky, come on, touch the sky, and we're gonna go down, across, up, 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 up in the sky, oh, come on, kids, right up there, down, across, and you get them repeating, down, across." Dan, you do silly voices and you do all kinds of anything to differentiate that sound and that action to make it stick in their head. The same way that I never forgot the guy's name was Lock Key and that guy was called Chris next to me. That was like three years ago or something and I still remember the guy next to me's name. It was genuinely ingrained in me. Um, and then we have to look for the sounds again, yeah? Yep. Just with T. So now T has different forms, like down and across and then down and hook and across the way. Which would you think is the better one to teach? In the font that this uses, that this product uses, the font is called Primary Sassoon. That's this font that gives you the nice A sounds, as opposed to the horrid computer A that looks like some weird thing with a hat over it. Even I can't do that weird Celtic A. I don't know what that is, but it ruins the kid's handwriting. Regarding that specific question, the, the Primary Sassoon font has the hook, so I do that because the books have it, but I don't mention the hook. I just go, oh, let's go okay, down, across. I just don't add, I try and simplify it to its bare minimum. If I could choose, I would probably not have the hook. But I'm not looking for reasons to reduce, I'm looking for ways I can, that, that's all. But yeah, the answer, good question, but and or either. I don't think it matters. What really matters is your engagement with them, the, your, your correct thing, your procedure, your timing. And the kids will just, kids just adapt to everything. No one's even ever, no kids ever actually asked me that. I've, all, I've always thought about that. Like, I wonder if anyone's going to pick up on the fact that sometimes there's a hook and sometimes there isn't. And they never ask me. They're just accepting. Yeah. I find that my kids, they'll decide on their own. So some of them will do without a hook and some will do with a okay. hook. And just accept empower, empower them to do that. That's their deal. Just like the, the lady at the back about the left and hand, right handed riding. Let them go with it until you find there's a problem. And then if there's a problem, then address it. If you're feeling it's an issue. Okay, and then obviously we do the same thing, t-edi, t -enis, t -er -t and all of these words are coming up later in, in the product, later on in the reading books, later on in the, in the, the activity worksheets. So they'll start knowing, you're, you're increasing their vocab now with all this stuff, and obviously it's sun. And then immediately you start blending the sounds again. We're immediately getting them reading as soon as we can. Yeah? S -a -a -t -a -t -s -a -t -s -a and you see the dots? This is to reinforce the sound counting. I get the feeling I left my flashcards for that. Oh no, here they are. It's like, these are the Glody Phonics cards and you, you do things like this with them. Okay guys, we're gonna read the word. This is a goat. It's a goat. How many sounds can you think are in the word goat? And you're really helping them, right? Goat. It's pretty straightforward. Goat. And think of, let's check. Are you ready? Goat. Well done. There are three. And what I'll do is to make sure they're not copying. If you've got, if you've got a load of these like uh, whiteboards, you know, these cheap. I've bought a ton of these. They're like fifty baht each. And uh, you can have the kids sitting in pairs or threes or whatever fours. And someone has the marker, and you go goat, and they get the marker, and, go, and they show you it rather than saying it. Because when kids start calling out, they're breaking your classroom procedure. Unless you allow them to shout out. Unless you say, right now, kids, you can shout out. 
but then you're not going to be really checking comprehension because you're not really sure who's getting it and who's just copying. Consider that. Not just that, I mean, consider that whole concept of at what point in your lesson plan are you checking that the kids have got what you've taught them? Or are you assuming again? It's really important to do check this stuff. Um, one of the things I used to get frustrated about was when I used to teach the Montessori stuff, you'd spend all this time really thinking you're doing a great job, and you say, at, and they go, Matt. They just guess. Montessori, the other stuff, the analytical phonics, encourages guessing, very much so. Uh, they, they, they know it's one of seven words. M, an, pan. They're just going to throw, they know they've got a one in seven chance of being right. So you do need to check that out. Uh, this one is it, it, it. I'm not going to do it soon, I'm not going to do the whole thing. This is insanely difficult. It, 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 inky sweat. Now, this one, the action for it, 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 is you heard the story? I had a, I had a mouse and there was some it, 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 ink on the desk, and the mouse ran and hit the it, it, ink, and the ink fell on him, and, and I got the mouse. And it's my pet, Inky. Inky has a lovely mustache. And we all want to have Inky's moustache and we all do this. It, 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 it. And that's the it, it, it sound. All right. So let's just do a very quick review. What sound? Good, good. So what, um, what word am I spelling? My kids can do that, by the way. My K2s can sit there and I can go, word of the day. And then just go, sit. Just like, like that, like immediate. Or you could say the next thing, write it down, write it down. And then you give them whiteboards and while they're writing it down, you're checking letter formation at the same time. You're checking every aspect at the same time there. And again, I've got 30 kids, I can't do it. Yes, you can. You can just have groups. Have six groups of five if you've got 30 kids in the room or five groups of four or whatever, how many groups you can get them down to. And differentiate at least two or three times a week where you set up stations. And it's just your moment to address those kids' direct needs and get a really genuine understanding of where they're failing or succeeding. And that one's the same, just down, dot, down, dot. I wish you know, that, that wasn't there. That's precursive, that little tail. It's precursive. So don't forget we've got print, precursive, and cursive. Yeah? Print is just print. Precursive is with tails. Do you remember that? Being in kindy yourself or primary yourself and learning to add tails because you were going to write like a, a big boy or a big girl later and all that stuff. And then cursive is the connection when you connect them. Is yeah. cursive still used? Yeah. Where? In the States it's not. In the States they've stopped it. Which one? I, um, I just found a thread on that very recently that some teachers were complaining why is cursive no longer taught in the States? Uh, we need to go back. It is, yeah. yeah. There was definitely maybe it's a, maybe it's a state yeah, thing. Uh, yeah, maybe it's a statewide thing. I don't. I don't your your crazy laws. I don't know how your country is set up because you. California just recently. Okay. Yes, yeah. yeah, so in England, I think. Does anyone know about England? We got some Brits in here. Do they still teach cursive in the UK? Last I heard from Britain. They do or they don't? They do. Yeah, I do. Um, I have a course on cursive that we do here as well. Yeah. Um, but also, there's another reason coming up in a minute. Why we still have your question? Sorry. Yeah, there's another reason uh, why we use cursive. It's to make a connection between diphthongs and digraphs. All right. That's very quickly. Now we're blending immediately. Yeah, you're immediately taking that word and blending it straight away. Don't wait. Striking while the iron's hot. Don't, don't, don't. Try not to be. Say don't. I can't tell you anything. Try not to be people that the teachers that just say, all right, now sit and colour that in. Why? For what? With K1, yeah, there's a point behind that. They need to practice. With K2, you maybe want to get standards out of them so they're getting it in the line. But, but is that the focus? Can you use that moment to grab four kids, send them over to the side of you and practice the formation with them? The colouring part could be the moment that gives you the freedom to grab kids and take them to smaller groups and work with them. But uh, do immediately start blending these words in that lesson. Earmark a certain amount of time in each period. Or if you meet them two or three times a day, bring it into the next part of your lesson. This one they like as well. This one is that my friend Peter and Paul were having popcorns and presents and it was his birthday and he loved pink and he loved pigs and he had a pink pig cake. And we were puffing out the candles on a pink pig cake. P -p 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 -p. Not pu, uh, p -p -p -p. yeah? Puff out the candles on the pink pig cake. P -p -p -p. That's it. And they love this one as well. Puff out the candles on the pink pig cake. And 
mics are pop, 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 pop the whole time is that. And they're going to go, pop, 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 that's all right. It doesn't matter. We're not, you're trying to give them this concept, this phonic awareness of how you can construct words from, from images. And the way that one's written, this one, because you have to use big body language again, instead of going up, up, high in the sky, this one goes down, down, down in the ground, up, around. Down, down, down in the ground, up, around. And then you start doing that again, the receptive, the productive. Can they see what you're doing? What am I spelling? Pat. What if I do? Tap. Uh, this kind of stuff. You can do it longer and longer and longer words. Um, you don't have to restrict yourself to three letters. Don't restrict yourself at all. <laughs> if they're going with it, ride those fences and ride that wave and get... I've, I've got a K2 and three kids here that are genuinely reading five, six letter words, genuinely dictating entire sentences back to me, um, not copying off the board. You know, like you can genuinely say, write the word, I went shopping with mummy, and they'll do that correctly. Or they might do it correctly according to phonics which is fine. If they use one of the alternative spellings that you've taught them, you don't correct that, because they were right, right? It's English that's wrong, right? Right. <laughs> Something like that. So, I mean, this, this is feasibly six letters. You could feasibly have done this in the first four to eight days of class, depending on the level you're at. K1, no, 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 just relax. Give them a month or two, ease them into it, have lots of activities, get, get them doing that in all different types of uh, art and craft. We will talk about scope and sequence in a minute. And the last one for this group is mmm, not na, mmm, mmm. And it was Nancy and Norman who went to hear the aeroplanes going mmm. And everyone runs around the class going mmm, mmm. Okay, hear the aeroplanes mmm. This is important to not confuse M mm and M, mm, yeah, or M and N, M and N. Yeah. Sorry, thinking of my rap music now. Sorry, <laughs> oh, it's colder. Right. Um, on that one, sorry, it's the same basically. Down, up, and over. Down, up, and over. Again, constantly making sure you're doing it in reverse with the left hand. Question it. Uh, sorry, yeah, question it. Good, good. Uh, point and say. Now this is something that um, the, the, the trainer that I studied with, who I'll give, give respect to for this, he explained this in much better detail than I can about how the brain works. But basically he explained roughly that we don't read with our eyes, we read with our ears. Your brain, your eyes basically take the information, send it to the part of your brain responsible for hearing. And your brain listens to the word. I'm sure I've said that wrong, and I'm sorry if I have, but it's along those lines, basically. That point and say basically mimics the way your brain is reading the word, and you have this audio-visual kinesthetic thing going on. So if you're going to say the word k -ah or s at, you would go s at, and you do it faster, s at. We've got all these point and say boards here, big ones that you can do individually with kids in groups of two or three you can come up to do. We have small A5 ones laminated that you can give to everyone in the room. And the kids sit practicing it. Uh, you give them a word, they look at the word, they copy the word, they're like at, and they, 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 they learn to read that way. Mm, one of the girls that works here uses little cars and gets them at, and she gets the car to race, like sit, and sit, and the kids go faster and faster. And you put the letters on the floor and they race through the sounds. Uh, it's kind of a cool one. I like to use actual cars. I actually like to have little Tonka cars, a little where they Hot Wheels cars, and get them to drive over the sounds as fast as they can while putting them together. Then you often, once you've got to a better level, you get the kids testing each other. Where one kid's reading a word to the other kid, and the other kid's trying to compile the word. Um, think out of the side of the box. This was, again, not, none of this is my idea. This is somebody else. <whistles> All right. Yes, and they can learn to put words together. Um, you can even add consonant clusters at the beginning, and they can practice like sp at. And you can say faster and faster and faster, spat, that kind of stuff. This I just made. I just bought some super, whatever it's called, magic tape. Bought some Velcro, bought some elastics, and just made them. 
pretty easy. These other cool little things, who wants to play with this later on? It's like a little homemade telephone. Again, this was somebody else's idea. I just went to Home Pro and I bought this for about eight or nine baht, stuck it together, sprayed it. And basically, you can try it anyway, it's kind of weird. If you want to focus on end sounds, like instead of saying, um, Thai kids like to mute the end sound of a hard consonant because of the written form of the Thai language. Instead of saying cat, they say cat. And there's a reason for that I don't want to go into. It's the Thai reason. It's, a, it's, a, it's called Dorsakot. It's the end sound of a Thai word. There's only eight of them. But in English, we've got over 20. So you need to focus on that. And you need, if your kids are saying to you, Teacher, I, want, I have a cat. First of all, your name is not Teacher. Your name is Mary or Jay or Sue or whatever. Your name is not Teacher. That's the first thing I want to say as a teacher. I don't like being called Teacher. And secondly, if they have a cat, then you might want to think about that kid's phonic awareness. Surely it's not a cat, it's a cat. And here's a good way of practicing that. Cat. And it really comes in. Do you want to try it? Say something with a hard end like cat or mad. Mad. Oh, yeah. It's really loud. <laughs> so press some of these around, have a little play with these for a minute. Um, just say something with a hard end sound on it. Yeah, it's really, really loud in the ear. <laughs> Super loud, right? <laughs> you can really hear yourself. <laughs> It's very, very loud in the air. And you can say to them, can you hear it? It's weird, isn't it? It's kind of, but I mean, we're kind of giggling using it. Imagine kids with it. They, they, they love it. They go crazy for that stuff. All right, I've only got a couple of minutes left. We started a little bit late, so we're going to end a tiny bit late. See if we can play that if you want. There for you. You can take one of these back with you. Whoever's, whoever's the supervisor here, grab one on your way out and take it as an example. I can leave it on the side for people. Right, now, moving on real quick. Jolly Fun, or the, this phonics type, type of phonics program also doesn't stop at the end of the single letters. We go into digraph, diphthongs, phonograms, and all that stuff. Basically, in simple, it's just two sounds making a single sound. That's all it is. It's not a consonant cluster, like sk, or sl, or pr, or cr. That's a consonant cluster. This is a single sound. And this is one of the reasons why I've yet to find a really good cursive font that mimics correct handwriting. I might have recently, I'll, 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 be, I'll, I'll be looking into that later on today if I can change this. But generally, when I do this stuff, I do draw it as a single sound, like that. And it just gets them in the habit of remembering it's one sound. And the general rule for these, uh, these kind of uh, diphthongs and digraphs is when it's vowels, when two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking. This is where you would need to know the names A, B, C. All right, if you want to do that route, if you want to go that route of teaching this, I don't necessarily do that route. I don't teach it that way. I just say it's called A. I don't give them a trick. I just tell them it's A. But if you are going to tell them two vowels go walking, the first does the talking, the name of that is A. And the sound of that is A. And the story for this is that the kids love this one because they get to be naughty. That the mum or the teacher was saying like, hey, Jay, come here. And Jay said, A. The mum said, hey, come here. And he said, A. I said, don't be naughty, come here. You can get the kids to be disrupt, dis, you know, disrespectful, like, hey, look at me. And they'll go, A. Hey. Like, you're going to get them to be intentionally willful to you. And then the kid got taken to the doctors, and they pulled out a big piece of earwax because his ear was in pain. A, hey, my ear's in pain. A, hey, what did you say? A, hey, pain. Hey, and all these A sounds coming out of it. And the song is a. Uh... But that's the action. My ear hurt, I was in pain. A. Hey? A, my ear hurt, I was in pain. What did you try to say? A. All right. And that's how I often connect those two together. And this is where you're going to have to be able to go like around, up and down, and up and down, and dot. If you want to track that across. All right. So I'll do it one more time to the candidates. You're going to track as well. You're not going to do it here because that's no good. You want to be able to track across the child's line of sight. Yeah? So you go around and up and down and up and down and dot. 
Now, it's just that melody, that, that fun, light way of explaining it that kind of gets more sticky for them. If anyone doesn't understand what I mean by sticky, read Malcolm Gladwell. He talks about sticky information, things being sticky. How do you make things more sticky? How do memes and fads stick? And there are certain characteristics to them, and one of them is that they're memorable. So uh, keep that in mind. O. Oh, no, look at the oak. Old goat under the old oak tree with his coat and his boat. Oh, oh, oh. The stories are recommended in the handbook, but I don't use any of them. I just make my own stories up. And they change daily. I just make them up on the spot. It's a two-step planning. That is a two-step plan. The stories are, how am I going to do this one? I'll do that one. Yeah. I've got about four stories for each one that I'll run through. And again, you need to be able to make sure that they're beginning their O's here and going that way around. Not like that. Because if you're beginning there, you haven't completed the surface, it's not going to work. You have to begin at 2 o'clock and go anti-clockwise. Yeah? So it would be around, up, all that kind of stuff, all right? Don't worry about that. Aye, aye, that's another good one. Aye, aye. And that's it, you get all the kids to stand up and be captains. Aye, aye, captain. And they go, aye, aye. All right, it's just a really memorable, simple... This was actually a good song. The captain says, aye, aye. And so you can hear it. Says, aye, aye. Stand up straight, don't be late, the captain says I am. And you can probably imagine a whole circle time activity for this if you're a kindy teacher, right? You can imagine linking that to all other content. There's all kinds of cool stuff to play with there. Um, now, just because to wrap it up, how much and when? This is not proscriptive, this is perscriptive. I'm not telling you what to do, I'm just outlining a situation for you. And it's you, it's up to you to decide what you do with that. But in, in schools that I work with, I've, I'm lucky enough to work with a couple of really great places that are very liberal and very open and let me basically manage how I like and they don't get up in my... They, 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 they leave me to do what I do and I leave them to do what they do. And uh, what we do there is K1, kindergarten one, primary uh, and band one, we basically do the first three groups only, which is like 18, 19 letters, 17, 16, 17 sounds, uh, eight, 18 sounds. Um, not too much writing, really. They're too young for that. I don't worry about it. Most of the literature from the company talks about K2 up. But I, I, I definitely begin in K1. I mean, I even begin in Boriban. If any of you have to go over to Boriban pre-K1, um, it's certainly a great way to start getting their phonic awareness up. It's very engaging for them. They enjoy it. By K2, what we do in, in, in my other school is uh, we do the whole of the first three groups throughout the whole of a year, for 40 weeks to get through all of this. And you just keep reviewing it, keep reviewing it, keep making it interesting. Experiment with different ways of approaching the content. Then by K2, start again. We don't just go straight from K1 and carry on. We start again. Because they're kids. You're not going to be experts in this after one hour of me talking to you, right? Yeah. You'd need to figure it out again later on and re-review it and think about it just as the kids do that. So we start again. And then we work a bit more on the writing and we, we, we work on full word reading and expanding their comprehension. But we do the, all the groups then. And then by K3, we start again. But obviously it's in a compressed time frame now. You know, you, you can review a word, a letter a day at that point. You're doing a letter a day, you're doing reading, you're doing decodable books. And there's a, all my books are over there, I haven't got anything to show you, I'm afraid. We're looking at sentence reading, we're looking at dictating, we're looking at tricky words, we're looking at doing spelling tests each week. All right, and we're not doing a cat in a hat, in a van with a pan and, a, and all that nonsense. It's genuine sentences. Jay, would you do any tricky words in K2? Yeah. Traditional sight words like the or things to Yep. The, the, the book, uh, the, the, the product has, this is tricky words group one. I can't remember how many tricky words there are. It's in the back of the handbook. But each, each set has about 10 tricky words in it. And there's some, I'm going to try, I'm going to say seven groups of tricky words maybe. I'm probably wrong. I can't remember. I have to look in the book. But there's a group of tricky words and you begin them after group three. So after you've done the first three groups, that's why we only do the first three groups with K1. And then in K2, yes, all groups, including tricky words. And what you can do is if you go onto Google and you, you write down, some, you, you look something like Jolly Phonics Tricky Word Board, you'll find some cool photos where they actually sell them, but you can make them. We used to have it here. It's like a flower pot, and it grows, and then one, one flower is tricky word one, and every petal is a tricky word. And then as they learn more, you draw another flower with another set of ten petals, and you build up a massive bouquet over the year on the wall and you constantly review that with them so the answer is yes I, I do do that <laughs> do do I do do that um, 
And I found with the K3s, they, if they've gone through this, they just take it with a head of steam and go. Phew. They don't look back, they don't think, they don't criticize, they, they just accept everything. Uh, anything else about that? No? Okay, yeah? Would you use the Jolly Pines books or do you? I do, yeah. Um, they're at the back if anyone wants to see them later. I purchased all of the handbooks, all of the teacher books, all of the workbooks, every section of it, and I read them and I use them. Uh, the most important back part of any teacher book is the introduction. It's really, really essential to read that, but I certainly do. Um, w w w would I necessarily buy them and put them in every stu student's bag? Um, not for K1, no. I don't think that would be a good use of funds. I think I'd rather have teacher-created resource for that. Um, and it would be a conversation I would have with the home teachers. Do you want the book? Because if you've got the book, you've got to use the book. Some people feel restricted by that. K3, certainly they should have some kind of uh, academic record of what they're learning, you know, academic uh, book to show what they're going through. But I'm not going to make a comment on that about whether a school should buy the book or not. I think that should be something that a good team that works as a team should talk about as a team. And, and, and if you're not able to communicate as a team, then that's probably more important than worrying about the book. Um, any other questions about that? Uh, today was a very basic overview. It was literally 60 minutes for what normally takes a whole day or two. All right. Um, they, there is a free app. That I, I think they only give you the first group or two for free. And then they want you to cash up. You know, they want you to divvy up the money after that. But it's good. And I like it. And it even has animated letters being rolled out for you. And you can certainly encourage parents that are... We all know there's two, two or three different types of parents. And the ones that are genuinely, not just helicoptering, that genuinely want to help, that they benefit from this. Uh, helicopter parents I wouldn't necessarily give them to because they just get it wrong and they just make the kid do it all on their own. Uh, that's not necessarily how it, what it's about. Um, when you finish this in K3, there is, a, there is another product you can move on to. I say, I'm not a salesman, I'm not here to sell anything. So please don't misunderstand that. I genuinely use them here. The next one is Jolly Grammar. And for those that do primary, it's, it's exceptional. All right, it's really exceptional. It uses all the same theory, um, but it approaches verbs, nouns, pronouns, all with an action and a color. In fact, just by coincidence, oh, actually, look, here you go. Student book, by the way, for phonics is here. So feel free to have a look at that and decide whether you feel... Do you want to pass that back to Jeremy for me? I've got some of those. Oh, you've got them? Okay, then don't worry about it. But it's there for people to look at. Um, but the Jolly Grammar product... I wonder if we need the cards here still. Ah, no, I'm making a mess. Never mind. They basically link colour and action to parts of speech. So verbs are red and verbs are this. Pronouns are black. Uh, sorry, uh, nouns are black. And you've got common nouns and proper nouns. And the idea is you should have to read a story. So my friend David went to the park to kick his ball. Things like that. The park, the park was called Tung Talad, and they, they should be able to... We were... So we, that's the pronoun for we. We were running the verbs. So uh, it, it's really good fun, and it works. But that's another day. Um, that's it, pretty much. Um, yeah? Um, I didn't get the I only got the first three groups of the letters. Can you put that slide back? Of course. Thank you. Um, the quickest way would be to find it on Google, but I can certainly go... But now let me go back to that. That one you mean? Yes. That's it? Okay, my pleasure. All right. uh, any other, anything, anything need clarifying on that? Is everyone okay? All right. Well, good. I want to thank everybody for your time. Um, I, we've got some certificates for everybody that's going to be, it's going to hopefully go towards your professional development. I know it's all about the certificate, right? So uh, the, the proof that you were, you were here, it's like having a set, we have to selfie the fact we were here, right? Um, this will be going live, or it is live now, and it will be reposted as a, as a standalone video, so you can please help share that. Um, I don't know if Ben has finished. Yeah. Get me bad. All right, so yeah, the, the, we'll, we'll get them to you in an envelope when they're finished printing, okay? I'll get them sent to someone who needs to collect that. Um, 
If anybody wants to ever privately to chat with me or they want to arrange another session on anything else from lesson planning, classroom management, uh, whatever it is that you feel like you're struggling, we can sit together and talk through ideas together. I'm, 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 I'm a big fan of collaboration. Please let me know if you need anything. Is that all right? Thank you ever so much, guys. Take this off. Get out of my house. <laughs> Thanks, sure.